Well, let me thank you all for being here. I'm joined by several of my colleagues. Uh, Twenty-two of us uh, are introducing legislation to provide a comprehensive response to our nation's water infrastructure needs. Flint, Michigan was a wake-up call for our nation, the wealthiest nation in the world, and yet we have inadequate water infrastructure in America that's affecting the health of our children and the health of American families. It is a primary function of government to provide safe drinking water for its population and clean water, and that this is a fundamental responsibility for our government. Our public health and environment depends upon it. What happens in Flint, Michigan is not isolated. The problems of water infrastructure needs are throughout our country today. And the problem is, for many in our political system, out of sight is out of mind. They don't see the pipes. And they don't see the leakage, and they don't see the lead. And as a result, uh, we have a crisis in America. Flint is not an isolated circumstance. The Environmental Protection Agency has estimated that the needs over the next 20 years for water infrastructure in America is $655 billion. That's $655 billion. Water main breaks in my own state of Maryland are common. You still remember when River Road in Montgomery County became a river. We've seen parts of the Washington Beltway closed. We've seen cities such as Dundalk and Baltimore where major streets had to be closed because of water main breaks. In the Baltimore City Public Schools, our water fountains are closed, cut off, because of lead problems from where the water reaches the school systems to how they're used within the water fountains themselves. That has not been corrected. That's not isolated to Baltimore City alone. Many of our cities around this nation have uh, had to close their their drinking fountains for their children. We have elevated level of blood in too many places in this country, and we know about it. Democrats have a comprehensive package to deal with this issue. True leadership. Now, I could go through what it stands for, but it's right there. I'll let you all read it. But true leadership, we have combined bills that have been filed by many of my colleagues to deal with water infrastructure in America. This should not be a partisan issue. And we look forward to working with our colleagues on both sides of the aisle because this is a national problem affecting every state in our nation. The True Leadership Act of 2016 will deal with investing in water infrastructure, $70 billion over a 10-year period. It more than triples the funding for the Environmental Protection Agency's Drinking Water State Revolving Fund and Clean Water State Revolving Fund. It increases funding uh, and permanently reauthorize the Water Infrastructure Financing Inv Innovation Act, WIFIA. It removes the cap on private activity bonds for water and wastewater infrastructure projects. It accelerates research into water technologies. It reforms lead notification, testing, and transparency. It establishes a mandatory reporting requirement for states to report elevated levels of blood in, in, in children. It updates EPA standards for for, for lead. It provides grant programs to help schools test for lead in drinking water. It provides for emergency response for FEMA so that they can respond to crises uh, on when we have lead contaminated drinking water. It removes lead from homes to build healthier communities. It's establishing a tax credit to cover lead hazard reductions in our homes and overall as Hal HUD deals with lead homes. It helps our school system mitigate the effects of lead poisoning on children and invest in American workers by protecting uh, our American workers through prevailing wage. This bill is comprehensive, and I thank my colleagues, many all, they're, they're here, and there's many that are not here, that have contributed to help uh, develop this legislation. One last point. The U.S. Conference of Mayors indicates that for every dollar we spend uh, on water infrastructure, our gross domestic product, our GDP, will grow by $6. So this is not only important for public health, not only important for our environment, it's also important for our economy. It's urgent that the Congress consider this legislation and consider it now. One of the great leaders on this issue who has done a lot in regards to the public housing, HUD issues, as far as other issues, uh, is the senior senator from Rhode Island, Senator Reed. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ben. I want to commend Ben's leadership and the leadership of all my colleagues that are here today. Uh, the tragedy in Flint reminds us that if government fails to fulfill its commitments, 
kids pay the price. And whether it's from contaminated water or soil or lead-based paint, which we know in, in the lead paint arena is the source of most lead poisoning cases, this is a preventable tragedy if we act, and we must act. That's our primary obligation. But effective programs designed to reduce lead exposure and prevent water contamination have gone underfunded by this body for too many years. This package of legislation makes important reforms, including uh, my legislation to improve the Healthy Healthy programs at HUD. But we also need to increase funding to help parents protect their children from lead hazards, which may already be present in their homes, in our water, and on the streets. This week, we took an important step on a bipartisan basis in the thud appropriations bill to provide increases in funding for lead poisoning prevention programs and to make improvements to those programs to better serve low-income families at risk for lead poisoning. This will provide real dollars for those efforts in the coming years. It costs a lot to remediate the effects of lead paint and toxins in the soil, which poison children across the country each year but nowhere near as much as it costs our society if the problem goes unchecked. This is an environmental justice issue. It's a criminal justice issue in some cases, and it's a social justice issue. It's time for Congress to address it in a comprehensive way. That's what this bill aims to do. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor, and again, I salute the leadership of Senator Cardin, Senator Mikulski, Senator Stabenauer, Senator Peters, Senator Boxer, Senator Menendez, Senator Whitehouse. <laughs> And Senator Durbin, too. <laughs> well, I want to thank all our colleagues for not only putting together this comprehensive bill that is so important, but supporting Senator Peters and I as we have brought to the forefront what has happened to 100,000 people in the city of Flint, 9,000 children under the age of six that now have some kind of lead poisoning in some areas, homes that have levels higher than a toxic waste dump. So we have seen uh, what happens when we're not paying attention to the issues around lead and lead exposure. Now, we also appreciate colleagues standing with us. We have put together a bipartisan package now that we will be uh, moving forward as it relates to Flint and a number of the issues around lead and water, but it doesn't take the place of what we have in front of us today in terms of a comprehensive approach, whether it's the drinking water fountain at school, whether it's lead and paint, whether it's the standards that we need to be addressing. All of the issues in this bill are critically important. This also goes to a very important difference in philosophy as well, though, because while the Republican state legislature and governor in Michigan were fighting against even having to follow the safe drinking water standards in the city of Flint, here in Congress, we were having to protect the EPA from even existing or certainly from being dramatically weakened in its ability to protect children and families in Flint and across the country. Very different approach. We understand a Clean Water Act <laughs> is important, that safe drinking water standards, that protecting our communities in terms of public health and safety is a basic right, and it's a responsibility of all of us. Flint, Michigan is an example of what happens when folks are in charge who don't believe that. And I finally want to thank President Obama and his administration for stepping up to help us in every way they can within their existing uh, budget, expanding health care for children under Medicaid uh, up to age 21 and pregnant moms in the city, expanding nutrition programs. We know the only thing, the only thing that mitigates lead in the body is better nutrition. That's what we have to offer. And then we have to focus on other health care and education problems after the fact. This bill is about preventing what the children and families in Flint are having to go through right now. And I strongly support it and hope that we can get the bipartisan support to get it passed. My partner in the efforts on Flint and what we're doing to help the families, Senator Peters. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Stabenow. And uh, as you mentioned, it's been a very rough time for us uh, in the state of Michigan. Uh, the uh, absolutely catastrophic situation that has impacted uh, Flint is one that has certainly captured 
the imagination uh, and horror of folks all across uh, this country. We certainly are pleased with the outpouring of support from people across the country for the people of Flint. But we also know that at some point the media lights will go down, the attention to Flint will disappear, and yet the impact of lead poisoning for the residents of Flint will continue for decades. In fact, uh, when you have thousands of children that were ingesting this poisoned water, we know that it has a permanent uh, impact on brain development that will be impacting these young people for the rest of their lives, and in some cases uh, other generations that this gets passed to uh, as well. That's why uh, I'm so pleased to be joined by, by all my colleagues uh, and the leadership of Senator Cardin and Reed and others in putting this legislation together. And what has become quite apparent is as bad as the situation is in Flint, uh, there are other situations like Flint's all across this country as well. In fact, uh, in Michigan, we've had re recent reports uh, just in the last week of other school districts which are showing elevated le uh, lead levels uh, in drinking fountains and water in those school districts and communities and suburban communities, other urban communities. This is a problem not exclusive to Michigan. It's every single state, communities all across uh, this country. We need a comprehensive approach. But as uh, Senator Stabenow, I support uh, this legislation. Let me be very clear. This doesn't take the place of what we are trying to do for the city of Flint right now. Uh, we are working right now to make sure that the that uh, Flint infrastructure can be improved and that there are public health programs for Flint as well as other communities uh, across the country. And as we're working on this comprehensive legislation to get this passed, the people of Flint can't wait any longer. We need to have more immediate action for Flint to complement the work that is being done by the state of Michigan. And Senator Stabenow and I and all of my colleagues here are all committed to make sure that we get help for the city of Flint as fast as possible and are looking for another vehicle to do that uh, as quickly as we can. The, the two issues that uh, I'm very pleased are included in this uh, package are ones that uh, Senator Sab and I have worked on. One is to make sure that the EPA has the authority to immediately notify the public when there are elevated lead levels. Uh, what happened in the case of Flint, actually the EPA was seeing these lead levels, but there was some confusion as to whether or not they should go public or whether or not it was up to the local state and local authorities uh, to make that information public, which makes absolutely no sense to us. If we see elevated levels of lead, you need to act as quickly as possible. This will require the EPA to make that information available immediately. The other aspect that has to be dealt with as we're improving infrastructure, pulling out lead service lines and making sure that we have safe pipes, is that when we do have a disaster or when people have been exposed to increased levels of lead, this is a long-term commitment that we need to make in order to make sure that particularly young people have the educational resources they need, the nutrition, uh, to mitigate some of the impact. So in this legislation is a grant of grants up to $50 million a year to communities uh, that have experienced a lead uh, disaster of some form or another to educate teachers to identify the signs of that poisoning and then to make sure that there are wraparound services available for those children as they uh, deal with what is a very difficult situation. So in closing, I just want to again uh, thank my colleagues uh, for stepping forward uh, to work on a comprehensive approach for the country, but I would certainly uh, say that we are continuing to be focused on Flint. We will not stop until the people of Flint get help as immediate as possible. Uh, I uh, uh, have been up there as well as my colleague delivering bottled water to people in, in, in Flint. In this great country of ours, you should not have to live on bottled water. You shouldn't have to bathe with bottled water. You shouldn't have to cook with bottled water. It's fundamental that everybody can turn on a tap and get clean water. That's not happening for Flint. It's not happening in other communities. And we're going to make a difference with this legislation. And that's why I want to thank uh, our next speaker, Senator Durbin, for his leadership on this issue yes. and so many others. Senator Boxer? Well, then Senator Boxer for our long term leadership. See? Boxer. Yes, my mic's, mic's in Durban. Oh, my God. Okay. The two, it's going to be the two Barbaras come next. And that's why we're going to use our little box here that we both use. And Oh, my gosh. What are they going to do with the, our box when we both leave here? For, we're going to leave it. We're going to leave it here for you to have a bidding war over, I guess. Um, I'm going to be extremely brief because there's a lot of folks. I want to say a couple of things. Ben Cardin, uh, he is a very senior member, most senior after me, on the Environment and Public Works Committee. And he has been my go-to person on water. And I'm so proud that he's leading the charge on this True Leadership Act. He is just the right person to do it. And I'm just thrilled. Um, here's the deal. The American Society of Civil Engineers gives our nation's drinking water infrastructure a D. 
a D. If any of our kids came home or our, anyone in our family with a D, we'd say, hey, you got to work harder. We need to work harder, and that's what this bill addresses. What happened in Flint is a national disgrace. It sears our souls, and it can't happen again. Now, I have a little bit of good news here. We look to be marking up the uh, water infrastructure bill next week, uh, the WERDA bill. We had a bill two years ago, but Sandra Inhofe and I believe we need another bill. We are hopeful that we can address this issue of lead in, in water as part. It would be a first, and we're hopeful we can reach bipartisan agreement on that. Um, the last thing I'll say is I have a bill that's included in here, which I'm proud of. Um, what we noticed is, and it was very clear, when there's an emergency declaration, it doesn't include, you can't say lead in water is an emergency. Under this legislation included in this bill, if there is such a declaration that there is lead in the water, the president would be absolutely authorized to move quickly to protect our children. So let me just say, as a United States senator from a state with 40 million people, and we've got lead in drinking water issues, as a mom and a grandmother, this is something we must do. And it is a great honor to introduce the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Barbara Mikulski. Thank you, Senator Boxer, the fighting Senator Boxer. I'm so pleased to be here with my colleagues today uh, on this very important uh, issue of really helping get the lead out of water uh, in our own country and lead out of our own Senate uh, acting on this and being able to move ahead. <clears throat> I want to congratulate Senator Cardin on being the leader in this effort. We stand with him shoulder to shoulder. I am so proud of him and what he's done on this issue. He has been a lifelong champion, first of all, of children, and then second, and not second, parallel, is really on leadership in terms of getting lead out of polluting our own people. Lead is self-inflicted. Lead is self-induced catastrophes. And Ben Cardin, whether it was getting lead out of the housing in Baltimore, lead paint, to now lead out of the water, he is leading the way. I've been so proud to serve with him as my pal and partner here in the United States Senate. I really like this bill, and I like it as a champion uh, for people, and I like it as an appropriator. I like the fact that it creates a dedicated program to get lead out of tap water. I like the fact that it adds more money, targeted money, that will not only get the lead out, but along the way, create jobs in our country in construction and lead remediation. I also like the fact that we're going to look at new tools and new technologies to be able to do it. The other thing that I like in this bill is that it makes lead in water eligible for FEMA disaster assistance. We know about hurricanes, we know about tornadoes, but how about nothing more tragic than when you can't turn on the spigot? Well, I think it's time we turn on the federal spigot. I think it's time we turn on the federal spigot and first of all begin to wash ourselves of inaction, of a sense of the lack of urgency, the fact that we are willing to sit around when all is said and done, more getting said than gets done. This legislation is an action plan. It is specific, it is targeted, and it is fiscally responsible. I'm happy to join in it. And I want you to know that I began my career as a child welfare social worker. And one of the big concerns that we had in Baltimore then, and we have in Baltimore today, is lead paint housing. So watching people try to eliminate blight, try to see what the impact it was on children, the fact that we know that lead in a child's blood supply will terribly impact their health and their cognitive development. And yet we are indifferent and we're even dismissive of the solutions to deal with it. And now as I'm in the final months of my Senate career, we're still trying to get the lead out. This is the time to act. And we're going to act on this bill, and we're looking at tools on the Appropriations Committee to be able to help Flint 
but Flint is only one of many cities that are going to face this. We have aging water infrastructure. This water infrastructure is aging in place. It is corrosive and it is irresponsible for us not to take action both in new authorizing and in appropriations. And we can do it. And what will it mean? It'll create jobs, it'll save lives, and ultimately it will save money. Everybody who gets sick off of lead becomes a cost, a cost to their family, a cost to society and the lack of productivity and the fact that we will pay for their health care and all the problems with it. Freddie Gray died a year ago today. Freddie Gray, long before that terrible ride in Baltimore, had was a victim of lead paint poisoning. He was a kid who never was able to quite get it together. And one of the reasons why is that we don't get it together to get the lead out. It's time to move. I now turn to my colleague, Senator Richard Durbin, who's just a fierce and unrelenting advocate on these issues from Illinois and our... Thanks, Ben Cardin, for your leadership on this issue and bringing us all together. Special thanks to Debbie Stabenow and, and Gary Peters, uh, who have really been the vocal advocates since the tragedy of uh, Flint was discovered. Bob Menendez, glad to join you in a bill to protect uh, the residents of uh, low-income housing, uh, and Ben Cardin to join you in the specific bill to set up new standards of monitoring water. Turns out in Chicago, the way we monitor it doesn't uh, discover the amount of lead in the water. It gets down to some basics here. A great nation doesn't have a third world water supply. Right. A great nation does not knowingly or negligently give its children and families poisoned and contaminated water. We believe that this is a great nation and we need to meet that standard of the kind of water supply that we can trust for our kids and our grandkids and everybody that we love, regardless, across America. And I'll just bring it down to the basics. The Republicans tell us over and over, government is the problem. It turns out they were right. Government was the problem in Flint, Michigan. It was government that made the decision to save money at the expense of the health of the families in Flint, Michigan. Now I've got news for them. Government is now the solution. We need to step up as a nation and make sure that we invest in a clean, trustworthy water supply so that every family in America goes to sleep at night knowing that the water they drank during the day isn't making their lives worse, it's making it better. Chuck Schumer, I understand you want to be acknowledged? I just acknowledged you. I don't want to speak. Okay, Bob, I think you're not. Well, thank you, and, and I'm, I'm glad to follow that historical precedent. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be one repeated. Very well. <laughs> That's why it's historical. I mean, uh, let me uh, let me uh, thank uh, Senator Cardin for his extraordinary leadership in this regard. I, I served with Ben Cardin on several committees, and I must say. Uh, this is just one example of his extraordinary leadership, and I appreciate it very much, and I, as well as Senator Reid and all of my colleagues. You know, I think the most significant role of the government is the safety and security of its citizens. And that also means safety from lead contamination, not just safety from Al-Qaeda and ISIL, which of course is a challenge, but domestically safety from lead poisoning. The dangers of lead exposure are not confined to just Flint. In New Jersey, we have school children drinking from lead-tainted water. We have kids breathing in lead-contaminated dust, and we have an aging water infrastructure, some pipes predating the Civil War. Local leaders across the country are in search of a solution, and the bills that we are unveiling today tackles our nation's lead crisis head-on. It includes two provisions that I have authored, the Sustainable Water Infrastructure Investment Act that I worked on with Congressman Bill Pascrell, would jumpstart greater investment in our crumbling water infrastructure simply by ending an antiquated tax regulation, by lifting the cap on private activity bonds for large-scale water and wastewater projects, it will allow communities to leverage a modest federal investment into billions of dollars of lower cost private capital to finance these badly needed upgrades. And it would create jobs and stimulate the economy. 
Congress has already exempted airports, intercity high-speed rail, solid waste disposal sites from these caps. Why not exempt our water infrastructure? By updating our water infrastructure, uh, that would be a tremendous help to this overall issue, uh, but it also can't be our only priority. Lead poisoning most often occurs and is most prevalent in aging housing stock. And we know that even limited lead exposure can fundamentally alter the course of a child's life. Just last year alone, 3,000 New Jersey children under the age of six had elevated levels of lead in blood from exposure to lead paint in their homes. We owe it to them and to their families that live in federally assisted housing to have standards aligned with the latest prevailing science. That's why I've worked with Senator Durbin, who has been a champion on this in Chicago, and on a separate provision of this bill to address the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's outdated and ineffective lead uh, standards. Under current HUD regulations, intervention is not required until the amount of lead in a child's blood is four times higher than the Center for Disease Control standards. That's unacceptable, short-sighted, and dangerous. Our provision would bring HUD's threshold for action in line with the CDC guidelines. HUD would also be required to inspect all homes before new, ma new families move in and to provide relocation options. And the EPA and HUD would be required to update their standards for lead in soil to make sure we can prevent lead issues before a child is exposed. These are practical investments we can make today to avoid significant and unnecessary costs tomorrow, both to our children, to our families, and to the government. And finally, we have a moral obligation to do better than century-old pipes and decades-old standards. We cannot sit back and watch our children being poisoned. The lesson of Flint is clear. Its lesson of Newark is clear. Let's learn from it and act upon it. Let's protect our drinking water, lift up our standards, put people to work, repair aging water systems, keep lead out of our homes, out of our communities, and protect our children for our future. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, Senator Whitehouse of Rhode Island, who has also been a strong champion on this issue. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, before I turn it over to Senator Markey to close the press conference, let me uh, note that many decades ago, it was health officials in the city of Baltimore who first did the vital research connecting lead paint with childhood lead poisoning. So it's very appropriate that Ben Cardin should be leading us on this effort. Baltimore and Maryland have been leading this science for a long time. Well after that, Providence, Rhode Island was described as the lead paint capital of the United States. And Jack Reed and I have been fighting this battle for many years. The tragedy of childhood lead poisoning is something that we have taken too long to be rid of. And so I am delighted to support this legislation. Senator Reid spoke earlier. Uh, we understand from our Rhode Island perspective how vitally important this is. I would say to Republican colleagues that if it turned out that a foreign agent had been behind the poisoning of American children in Flint, they'd be all over this. But the fact that it's pollution, for some reason, is not as motivating a factor. But I would remind everyone that if you're the child at the business end of a faucet that is providing dangerous water in your home, you don't care who's to blame. It's your brain that's being effective, it's your development that's being compromised, and it's to you that we owe the responsibility to act. So with that, I bring on the wonderful uh, Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you, Sheldon, so much. And, uh, and, and we have a united caucus on these issues. Uh, ben Cardin, our leader, but animated by the leadership of Debbie Stabenow and Gary Peters from Michigan who have taken Flint uh, and turned it into a metaphor for the whole country, uh, which has now led to the education, activation, and soon, we hope, implementation of answers to these questions. The great poet W.H. Auden once said that thousands have lived without love, but not one without water. Tragically, because of 
the congressional Republican efforts to block emergency funding, the people of Flint, Michigan are living without both from their government. Uh, and it is time for us to act. A hundred years ago, life expectancy in the United States was 48 years of age. 48. We've gone from the Garden of Eden to a hundred years ago, and that's all that we had accomplished. But then the progressive movement said that it's time for us to solve this problem. And at the top of the list, was cleaning up the water of our country, cleaning up the sewerage, cleaning up the drinking water, so that no longer would people die from the contamination that they were exposed to. That was the single greatest public health breakthrough in American and world history. And now we are 100 years later. Those pipes are old. The lessons are old, but still, Today, we have a problem that is not being dealt with by the Republicans in Congress, which is that we now must upgrade the protections today to deal with the aging systems which we have in our country. And what is happening in Flint is a national disgrace made worse by the Congressional Republicans' failure to fund the emergency money needed to help the people in Flint. My legislation included in this package the contaminant and lead electronic accounting and reporting requirements for drinking water or Clear Drinking Water Act includes mandatory immediate notification of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and state and local health agencies when there are drinking water violations with the potential to have serious adverse effects on human health. The legislation requires the EPA to establish requirements for the electronic reporting of the water system compliance data. The faster the data are available to the EPA, the quicker the response to the community. This moves towards electronic monitoring and reporting of drinking water quality that will help bring our drinking water infrastructure into the 21st century. The color of your skin, the neighborhood you call home, and your net worth should not determine your availability to uh, clean and safe drinking water. The clear drinking water legislation helps ensure that EPA addresses drinking water concerns in disadvantaged communities by allowing the direct request of drinking water quality testing and by initiating partnerships with community and scientific organizations. The situation in Flint is heartbreaking, but sadly there are communities all across our country. In Massachusetts right now there are 33 water systems that exceed the federal standard since 2013. That number should be zero in Massachusetts. It should be zero in every single state in our country. We have to be at least as good as the people were 100 years ago in our country. This is a problem. We should do something about it now. I thank Ben and the Michigan uh, senators for their great leadership on the issue. And let me just close by uh, acknowledging that uh, there are 22 that have co-sponsored the bill. Uh, that number, I expect, will grow. So there's great interest in our caucus on this legislation, and as been pointed out, so many of our colleagues have contributed to the package. Uh, it's urgent, and we're going to look for every opportunity to move this package. Uh, as Senator Box already mentioned in the Water Resources Development Act that will be soon before the EPW committee. We had the appropriation process. We're going to be looking for every opportunity to advance this package. Yes. Uh, Senator Stavon, I want to hear yeah. uh, you react to the first criminal charges, please, and uh, that have been filed in the Flint case. Well, there are a number of investigations going on. They have filed the first criminal charges. Uh, the U.S. Attorney and others are looking at uh, charges as well. Um, I believe that the accountability will come for the decisions that were made, and our focus is on making sure the people of Flint get all the help that they can as quickly as possible. Just to add, uh, the, uh, the charges that are coming forward uh, shows that what we had in Flint was not just gross incompetence on the part of individuals who made some horrible decisions and may also be criminal. 
And as a result of that, I believe that we need to step up our efforts uh, to help uh, the people of the city of Flint as a result of this. Uh, as was mentioned, it uh, doesn't matter if this is a man-made disaster or a natural disaster. It is a disaster to the people of Flint. And if there was criminal activity involved, it is even more imperative for us to step up and provide the resources necessary to, to get through a very difficult situation. So do you have a vehicle yet for the Flint bill? We are looking at uh, a number of things. We're, we're very, very grateful for the, the EPW leadership, both the chairman, Senator Inhofe, and ranking member Barbara Boxer, as well as Senator Cardin and others are, are, are extraordinarily supportive of our resolving this. We also have support from appropriators. So we're, we're looking for the, the best way to be able to move this forward, and, and we uh, hope to have a pathway soon. Let me just underscore, the Democratic Caucus so, totally supports what Senator Stavon and Alan Peters in their effort to get immediate action in regards to Flint. We also recognize this is a national problem and we want to see a national solution, but we are fully supportive of urgent, immediate action to help the people of Flint. Let me just add to this. You know, we have a Water Resources Development Act, and it would seem to me to be nonsensical to look away from the whole issue of lead poisoning, whether it's in Flint or any other place. There's, remember, this is, Flint is just one example. We've got them all over the nation. Kids can't drink drinking water at the, at the school fountain. Uh, we've got issues. There's an issue in Mississippi, and there is a Republican Art Committee who's from Mississippi. So I would just say this, you know, keep your ear to the ground in terms of the word of bill. We don't know exactly what's coming, but I think it would, I would be surprised if it wasn't addressed. Uh, the larger issue of lead and drinking water was not addressed in WERDA. That would make no sense. It's the Water Resources Development Act. So, uh, you know, Ben and I have been working with Senators Inhofe and other colleagues, and I feel, uh, I feel good about it. And, and I think the Senators from Michigan are doing exactly the right thing. When you've got it... Uh, the, the, no, I'm talking about WERDA. I'm talking about WERDA. And WERDA may even look at some of these things. That, and if we can get some of this done through WERDA, we're going to do it. The point I'm making is the senators from Michigan, they have their eye on getting this done. So they're doing what every good legislator does. you got to approach it from many tracks. You have, you know, track one may be appropriations. Track two may be WERDA. Track three may be true leadership. There are many other tracks. Another track is just to keep on bringing back their package on every moving bill. They're going to get it done, my prediction, not theirs. I know they will because they have tenacity and they have the facts on their side and how anyone could look away from what happened to these children. I'm glad there's criminal charges here because a lot of people just feel, you know, these things happen and there's no accountability. Good for that. Is it, a, is it the state district attorney? The, the, the state the attorney, attorney general. The state attorney office, general. And U.S. attorney is also uh, doing investigations. Uh, last question, yes. Well, to, to that point, um, the charges that were brought today appear to be kind of uh, on the ground, front line people. Do they go high enough? This doesn't seem to be getting close to Snyder yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I, all I would say is I think it, the facts need to go where they lead. Mm -hmm. And wherever they go, there needs to be the maximum amount of accountability. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks.